प्रैक्टिकल वेदांता पार्ट थ्री डिलीवर्ड इन लंडन सेवेंटीन नवंबर एटीन नाइन्टी सिक्स इन द छोग्य उपनिषद वी रेड दैट अ सेज कॉल्ड नारदा केम टू अनदर कॉल्ड सनात कुमारा एंड आस्क हिम वेरियस क्वेश्चन ऑफ विच वन वॉज इफ रिलीजन वॉज द कॉज ऑफ थिंग्स एज दे आर एंड सनात कुमारा लीड्स हिम एज इट वर स्टेप बाय स्टेप telling him that there is something higher than this earth and something higher than that and so on till he comes to akasha ether ether is higher than light because in the ether are the sun and the moon lightning and the stars in ether we live and in ether we die then the question arises if there is anything higher than that and sanat kumara tells him of prana this prana according to the vedanta is the principle of life it is like ether an omnipresent principle and all motion either in the body or anywhere else is the work of this prana it is greater than akasha and through it everything lives prana is in the mother in the father in the sister in the teacher prana is the knower i will read another passage where shwetketu asks his father about the truth and the father teaches him different things and concludes by saying that which is the fine cause in all these things of it are all these things made that is the all that is truth thou art that o shwetketu and then he gives various examples as a bee o shwetketu gathers honey from different flowers and as the different honeys do not know that they are from various trees and from various flowers so all of us having come to that existence know not that we have done so now that which is that subtle essence in it all that exists has its self it is the true it is the self and thou o shwet ketu are that he gives another example of the rivers running down to the ocean as the rivers when they are in the ocean do not know that they have been various rivers even so when we come out of that existence we do not know that we are that o shwet ketu thou art that so on he goes with his teachings now there are two principles of knowledge the one principle is that we know by referring the particular to the general and the general to the universal and the second is that anything of which the explanation is sought is to be explained so far as possible from its own nature taking up the first principle we see that all our knowledge really consists of classifications going higher and higher when something happens singly we are as it were dissatisfied when it can be shown that the same thing happens again and again we are satisfied and call it law when we find that one apple falls we are dissatisfied but when we find that all apples fall we call it the law of gravitation and are satisfied the fact is that from the particular we deduce the general when we want to study religion we should apply this scientific process the same principle also holds good here and as a fact we find that that has been the method all through in reading these books from which i have been translating to you the earliest idea that i can trace is this principle of going from the particular to the general we see how the bright ones became merged into one principle and likewise in the ideas of the cosmos we find the ancient thinkers going higher and higher from the fine elements they go to finer and more embracing elements and from these particulars they come to one omnipresent ether and from that even they go to an all embracing force or prana and through all this runs the principle that one is not separate from the others it is the very ether that exists in the higher form of prana or the higher form of prana concretes so to say and becomes ether and that ether becomes still grosser and so on the generalization of the personal god is another case in point we have seen how this generalization was reached and was called the sum total of all consciousness but a difficulty arises it is an incomplete generalization 
we take up only one side of the facts of nature, the fact of consciousness, and upon that we generalize, but the other side is left out. So, in the first place it is a defective generalization. There is another insufficiency, and that relates to the second principle. Everything should be explained from its own nature. There may have been people who thought that every apple that fell to the ground was dragged down by a ghost, but the explanation is the law of gravitation, and although we know it is not a perfect explanation, yet it is much better than the other, because it is derived from the nature of the thing itself, while the other posits an extraneous cause. So throughout the whole range of our knowledge, the explanation, which is based upon the nature of the thing itself is a scientific explanation, and an explanation which brings in an outside agent is unscientific. So the explanation of a personal God as the creator of the universe has to stand that test. If that God is outside of nature, having nothing to do with nature, and this nature is the outcome of the command of that God and produced from nothing, it is a very unscientific theory, and this has been the weak point of every theistic religion throughout the ages. These two defects we find in what is generally called the theory of monotheism, the theory of a personal God, with all the qualities of a human being multiplied very much, who, by his will, created this universe out of nothing and yet is separate from it. This leads us into two difficulties. As we have seen, it is not a sufficient generalization, and secondly, it is not an explanation of nature from nature. It holds that the effect is not the cause, that the cause is entirely separate from the effect. Yet all human knowledge shows that the effect is but the cause in another form. To this idea the discoveries of modern science are tending every day, and the latest theory that has been accepted on all sides is the theory of evolution, the principle of which is that the effect is but the cause in another form, a readjustment of the cause, and the cause takes the form of the effect. The theory of creation out of nothing would be laughed at by modern scientists. Now, can religion stand these tests? If there be any religious theories which can stand these two tests, they will be acceptable to the modern mind, to the thinking mind. Any other theory which we ask the modern man to believe, on the authority of priests, or churches, or books, he is unable to accept, and the result is a hideous mass of unbelief. Even in those in whom there is an external display of belief, in their hearts there is a tremendous amount of unbelief. The rest shrink away from religion, as it were, give it up, regarding it as priestcraft only. Religion has been reduced to a sort of national form. It is one of our very best social remnants, let it remain. But the real necessity, which the grandfather of the modern man felt for it is gone, he no longer finds it satisfactory to his reason. The idea of such a personal God, and such a creation, the idea which is generally known as monotheism in every religion, cannot hold its own any longer. In India it could not hold its own because of the Buddhists, and that was the very point where they gained their victory in ancient times. They showed that if we allow that nature is possessed of infinite power, and that nature can work out all its wants, it is simply unnecessary to insist that there is something besides nature. Even the soul is unnecessary. The discussion about substance and qualities is very old, and you will sometimes find that the old superstition lives even at the present day. Most of you have read how, during the Middle Ages, and, I am sorry to say, even much later, this was one of the subjects of discussion, whether qualities adhered to substance, whether length, breadth, and thickness adhered to the substance which we call dead matter, whether, the substance remaining, the qualities are there or not. To this our Buddhist says, you have no ground for maintaining the existence of such a substance, the qualities are all that exist, you do not see beyond them. 
This is just the position of most of our modern agnostics. For it is this fight of the substance and qualities that, on a higher plane, takes the form of the fight between nomenon and phenomenon. There is the phenomenal world, the universe of continuous change, and there is something behind which does not change, and this duality of existence, nomenon and phenomenon, some hold, is true, and others with better reason claim that you have no right to admit the two, for what we see, feel, and think is only the phenomenon. You have no right to assert there is anything beyond phenomenon, and there is no answer to this. The only answer we get is from the monistic theory of the Vedanta. It is true that only one exists, and that one is either phenomenon or nomenon. It is not true that there are two something changing, and, in and through that, something which does not change, but it is the one and the same thing which appears as changing, and which is in reality unchangeable. We have come to think of the body, and mind, and soul as many, but really there is only one, and that one is appearing in all these various forms. Take the well-known illustration of the monists, the rope appearing as the snake. Some people, in the dark or through some other cause, mistake the rope for the snake, but when knowledge comes, the snake vanishes and it is found to be a rope. By this illustration we see that when the snake exists in the mind, the rope has vanished, and when the rope exists, the snake has gone. When we see phenomenon, and phenomenon only, around us, the nomenon has vanished, but when we see the nomenon, the unchangeable, it naturally follows that the phenomenon has vanished. Now, we understand better the position of both the realist and the idealist. The realist sees the phenomenon only, and the idealist looks to the nomenon. For the idealist, the really genuine idealist, who has truly arrived at the power of perception, whereby he can get away from all ideas of change, for him the changeful universe has vanished, and he has the right to say it is all delusion, there is no change. The realist at the same time looks at the changeful. For him the unchangeable has vanished, and he has a right to say this is all real. What is the outcome of this philosophy? It is that the idea of personal God is not sufficient. We have to get to something higher, to the impersonal idea. It is the only logical step that we can take. Not that the personal idea would be destroyed by that, not that we supply proof that the personal God does not exist, but we must go to the impersonal for the explanation of the personal, for the impersonal is a much higher generalization than the personal. The impersonal only can be infinite, the personal is limited. Thus we preserve the personal and do not destroy it. Often the doubt comes to us that if we arrive at the idea of the impersonal God, the personal will be destroyed, if we arrive at the idea of the impersonal man, the personal will be lost. But the Vedantic idea is not the destruction of the individual, but its real preservation. We cannot prove the individual by any other means, but by referring to the universal, by proving that this individual is really the universal. If we think of the individual as separate from everything else in the universe, it cannot stand a minute. Such a thing never existed. Secondly, by the application of the second principle, that the explanation of everything must come out of the nature of the thing, we are led to a still bolder idea, and one more difficult to understand. It is nothing less than this, that the impersonal being, our highest generalization, is in ourselves, and we are that. O Shwet Ketu, thou art that. You are that impersonal being, that God for whom you have been searching all over the universe is all the time yourself, yourself not in the personal sense but in the impersonal. The man we know now, the manifested, is personalized, but the reality of this is the impersonal. To understand the personal we have to refer it to the impersonal, 
the particular must be referred to the general, and that impersonal is the truth, the self of man. There will be various questions in connection with this, and I shall try to answer them as we go on. Many difficulties will arise, but first let us clearly understand the position of monism. As manifested beings we appear to be separate, but our reality is one, and the less we think of ourselves as separate from that one, the better for us. The more we think of ourselves as separate from the whole, the more miserable we become. From this monistic principle we get at the basis of ethics, and I venture to say that we cannot get any ethics from anywhere else. We know that the oldest idea of ethics was the will of some particular being or beings, but few are ready to accept that now, because it would be only a partial generalization. The Hindus say we must not do this or that because the Vedas say so, but the Christian is not going to obey the authority of the Vedas. The Christian says you must do this and not do that because the Bible says so. That will not be binding on those who do not believe in the Bible. But we must have a theory which is large enough to take in all these various grounds. Just as there are millions of people who are ready to believe in a personal creator, there have also been thousands of the brightest minds in this world who felt that such ideas were not sufficient for them and wanted something higher and wherever religion was not broad enough to include all these minds, the result was that the brightest minds in society were always outside of religion, and never was this so marked as at the present time, especially in Europe. To include these minds, therefore, religion must become broad enough. Everything it claims must be judged from the standpoint of reason. Why religions should claim that they are not bound to abide by the standpoint of reason, no one knows. If one does not take the standard of reason, there cannot be any true judgment, even in the case of religions. One religion may ordain something very hideous. For instance, the Mohammedan religion allows Mohammedans to kill all who are not of their religion. It is clearly stated in the Quran. Kill the infidels if they do not become Mohammedans. They must be put to fire and sword. Now if we tell a Mohammedan that this is wrong, he will naturally ask, How do you know that? How do you know it is not good? My book says it is. If you say your book is older, there will come the Buddhist and say, My book is much older still. Then will come the Hindu and say, my books are the oldest of all. Therefore, referring to books will not do. Where is the standard by which you can compare? You will say, look at the Sermon on the Mount, and the Mohammedan will reply, look at the ethics of the Quran. The Mohammedan will say, who is the arbiter as to which is the better of the two? Neither the New Testament nor the Quran can be the arbiter in a quarrel between them. There must be some independent authority, and that cannot be any book, but something which is universal, and what is more universal than reason? It has been said that reason is not strong enough. It does not always help us to get at the truth, many times it makes mistakes, and, therefore, the conclusion is that we must believe in the authority of a church. That was said to me by a Roman Catholic but I could not see the logic of it. On the other hand I should say, if reason be so weak, a body of priests would be weaker and I am not going to accept their verdict, but I will abide by my reason, because with all its weakness there is some chance of my getting at truth through it while, by the other means, there is no such hope at all. We should, therefore, follow reason and also sympathize with those who do not come to any sort of belief, following reason. For it is better that mankind should become atheist by following reason than blindly believe in two hundred millions of gods on the authority of anybody. What we want is progress, development, realization. No theories ever made men higher. 
No amount of books can help us to become purer. The only power is in realization, and that lies in ourselves and comes from thinking. Let men think. A clod of earth never thinks, but it remains only a lump of earth. The glory of man is that he is a thinking being. It is the nature of man to think, and therein he differs from animals. I believe in reason and follow reason having seen enough of the evils of authority, for I was born in a country where they have gone to the extreme of authority. The Hindus believe that creation has come out of the Vedas. How do you know there is a cow? Because the word cow is in the Vedas. How do you know there is a man outside? Because the word man is there. If it had not been, there would have been no man outside. That is what they say. Authority with a vengeance. And it is not studied as I have studied it, but some of the most powerful minds have taken it up and spun out wonderful logical theories round it. They have reasoned it out, and there it stands, a whole system of philosophy, and thousands of the brightest intellects have been dedicated through thousands of years to the working out of this theory. Such has been the power of authority, and great are the dangers thereof. It stunts the growth of humanity, and we must not forget that we want growth. Even in all relative truth, more than the truth itself, we want the exercise. That is our life. The monistic theory has this merit that it is the most rational of all the religious theories that we can conceive of. Every other theory, every conception of God which is partial and little and personal is not rational. And yet monism has this grandeur that it embraces all these partial conceptions of God as being necessary for many. Some people say that this personal explanation is irrational. But it is consoling, they want a consoling religion, and we understand that it is necessary for them. The clear light of truth very few in this life can bear, much less live up to. It is necessary, therefore, that this comfortable religion should exist, it helps many souls to a better one. Small minds whose circumference is very limited and which require little things to build them up never venture to soar high in thought. Their conceptions are very good and helpful to them, even if only of little gods and symbols. But you have to understand the impersonal, for it is in and through that alone that these others can be explained. Take, for instance, the idea of a personal god. A man who understands and believes in the impersonal, John Stuart Mill, for example, may say that a personal God is impossible and cannot be proved. I admit with him that a personal God cannot be demonstrated. But he is the highest reading of the impersonal that can be reached by the human intellect and what else is the universe but various readings of the Absolute. It is like a book before us and each one has brought his intellect to read it and each one has to read it for himself. There is something which is common in the intellect of all men, therefore certain things appear to be the same to the intellect of mankind. That you and I see a chair proves that there is something common to both our minds. Suppose a being comes with another sense, he will not see the chair at all, but all beings similarly constituted will see the same things. Thus this universe itself is the absolute, the unchangeable, the nominin, and the phenomenon constitutes the reading thereof. For you will first find that all phenomena are finite. Every phenomenon that we can see, feel, or think of, is finite, limited by our knowledge, and the personal God as we conceive of Him is in fact a phenomenon. The very idea of causation exists only in the phenomenal world and God as the cause of this universe must naturally be thought of as limited and yet He is the same impersonal God. This very universe, as we have seen, is the same impersonal being read by our intellect. 
वट एवर इज रियालिटी इन द यूनिवर्स इज दैट इन पर्सनल बींग एंड द फॉर्म्स एंड कॉन्सेप्शन आर गिवन टू इट बाय आर इंटेलेक्ट्स वट एवर इज रियल इन दिस टेबल इज दैट बींग एंड द टेबल फॉर्म एंड ऑल अदर फॉर्म्स आर गिवन बाय आर इंटेलेक्ट्स नाउ मोशन फॉर इंस्टेंस विच इज अ नेसेसरी एजोंट ऑफ द फेनोमिनल कैनॉट बी प्रेडिकेटेड ऑफ द यूनिवर्सल Every little bit every atom inside the universe is in a constant state of change and motion but the universe as a whole is unchangeable because motion or change is a relative thing we can only think of something in motion in comparison with something which is not moving there must be two things in order to understand motion the whole mass of the universe taken as a unit cannot move in regard to what will it move it cannot be said to change with regard to what will it change so the whole is the absolute but within it every particle is in a constant state of flux and change it is unchangeable and changeable at the same time impersonal and personal in one this is our conception of the universe of motion and of god and that is what is meant by thou art that thus we see that the impersonal instead of doing away with the personal the absolute instead of pulling down the relative only explains it to the full satisfaction of our reason and heart the personal god and all that exists in the universe are the same impersonal being seen through our minds when we shall be rid of our minds our little personalities we shall become one with it this is what is meant by thou art that for we must know our true nature the absolute the finite manifested man forgets his source and thinks himself to be entirely separate we as personalized differentiated beings forget our reality and the teaching of monism is not that we shall give up these differentiations but we must learn to understand what they are we are in reality that infinite being and our personalities represent so many channels through which this infinite reality is manifesting itself and the whole mass of changes which we call evolution is brought about by the soul trying to manifest more and more of its infinite energy we cannot stop anywhere on this side of the infinite our power and blessedness and wisdom cannot but grow into the infinite infinite power and existence and blessedness are ours and we have not to acquire them they are our own and we have only to manifest them this is the central idea of monism and one that is so hard to understand from my childhood everyone around me taught weakness i have been told ever since i was born that i was a weak thing it is very difficult for me now to realize my own strength but by analysis and reasoning i gain knowledge of my own strength i realize it all the knowledge that we have in this world where did it come from it was within us what knowledge is outside none knowledge was not in matter it was in man all the time nobody ever created knowledge man brings it from within it is lying there the whole of that big banyan tree which covers acres of ground was in the little seed which was perhaps no bigger than 1/8 of a mustard seed all that mass of energy was there confined the gigantic intellect we know lies called up in the protoplasmic cell and why should not the infinite energy we know that it is so it may seem like a paradox but is true each one of us has come out of one protoplasmic cell and all the powers we possess were called up there you cannot say they came from food for if you heap up food mountains high what power comes out of it the energy was there potentially no doubt but still there so is infinite power in the soul of man whether he knows it or not its manifestation is only a question of being conscious of it slowly this infinite giant is as it were waking up becoming conscious of his power and arousing himself and with his growing consciousness 
more and more of his bonds are breaking, chains are bursting asunder, and the day is sure to come when, with the full consciousness of his infinite power and wisdom, the giant will rise to his feet and stand erect. Let us all help to hasten that glorious consummation.